So good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to join you today. My name is Nicola Bedlington. I am the former Secretary General of the European Patients Forum. I led the Patients Forum for 14 years and had the pleasure to get to know NPO, the umbrella organization in Bulgaria very well and work with your leadership. So it's a particular pleasure to join with you today to talk a little bit about active citizenship at local and national reform in healthcare systems. In my presentation, I'd like to give you a little bit of an introduction and context. What does active citizenship in healthcare mean? How can patients be active participants in their healthcare decision making? And some of the key considerations for advocacy work, for campaign work. And to just draw on a couple of good examples of active citizenship at European and at national level, which may be helpful for you and inform some of your work in Bulgaria. So the key question is why advocate in health policy? Will it make a real difference to patients and citizens at the end of the day? And the resounding answer to that question is yes, it will, if we get it right. And if we close the deal to ensure whatever we achieve with policymakers to make legislation work for patients and citizens is actually translated into real world set settings. The real work, the real hard work only starts when a legislation is adopted and then it's for patient organizations to really be very vigilant and make sure that it's properly implemented and it impacts positively on their communities. So what does active citizenship in health mean? Active citizenship or engaged citizenship actually means active participation of a citizen under the law of a nation discussing and educating themselves in politics and society. Active citizens may be involved in public advocacy and protest, really working together to effect change in their communities. And in health, this means working towards better health policy, striving for better health systems, health services, leading to better person-centered outcomes. In primary, secondary and tertiary prevention, and also alongside that patient-centered disease management. And this can be in a local hospital setting, in a regional context, or in a national setting with your national parliament and jurisdiction. Some of the key issues that patient organizations and citizens organizations need to perhaps consider when they're thinking about influencing policy is first of all, when to be proactive and agenda setting on a topic that is very close to your heart and when to be reactive, for example, when government has actually proposed a piece of legislation that isn't ideal for your community. And it's probably a blend of both. You need to be proactive as an organization, but also reacting when needed. To advocate with policymakers, patient organizations need absolute clarity on what they want, why they want it, and why it is the right way for policymakers to go, why they will be making the right decision if they support your ask. Patient organizations need consensus and unity among their membership on the lines to take. If there's discord, if there's a dispute about what the policy action should be, this gives a great opportunity for policymakers to really divide and rule and not make any progress on the issue at hand. So this unity and solidarity is critical. Patient organizations need to decide on a case by case basis, when to advocate for their own disease and when it's better to address the broad picture. So cross cutting topics affecting all patient groups in alliances, collaborating with other patient organizations or umbrella networks. And we need to bear in mind, of course, that health policy decisions are very rarely made to address disease specific 
needs. So again, this unity and solidarity is really important. Patient organisations need to do some serious planning and preparation work in order to affect change. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen just by accident or by a few ad hoc activities. It really takes a lot of thinking, a lot of work. Patient organisations need an advocacy strategy on a policy issue together with a very clear timeline with deadlines around external milestones. So when perhaps uh, the policymaker is issuing a deadline to submit amendments to a policy proposal, or when there's a deadline to respond to a specific consultation on a health topic. It's really, really important to be organized in that respect because you as an organization leader need to consult with your colleagues about the steps to take. So that planning is definitely very, very important piece of work. There needs to be also intelligence gathering on the process and the issue. Patient organizations need to be able to and ready to modify their activities and their tactics as an issue takes speed. Because very often as a piece of legislation or a policy goes through its journey, things happen there might be an external event there might be some media coverage that you need to react to very quickly so essentially it means constantly doing your homework patient organizations need to know their audience identify who is the key target and research this thoroughly the lead policy maker or shaper is critical they can make or break a campaign who are the champions around that person? Who will they listen to? Who are their adversaries, their opponents? What information about this person will help to create a bridge towards our policy goal? What are his or her concerns, pressure points, pain points? What might mobilize their support? It's really a question of thinking about what that person is thinking about, his, how he or she really ticks and some of the levers to get their people and themselves on your side. Patient organizations need to decide on their positioning and their style. Is it moderate, solution-oriented, reasoned and reasonable, discreet, or is it more direct, radical, uncompromising campaign, media oriented, direct action type work. And sometimes patient organizations need to do a blend of the two, depending on the circumstances and depending on at what stage a particular campaign is at. So with all that in mind, a few examples of patients and citizens involvement in policymaking. Let's go to Ireland. IPOSI, the Irish platform for patient organisations, science and industry, is a patient-led platform and is extremely effective, not only at national level, they have headquarters in Dublin, but also they have local chapters throughout Ireland that are also really active and really effective in local work. At national level, they're a member of the National Health Technology Assessment Agency Scientific Advisory Board. So they're bringing the patient's evidence into discussions around HTA. Together with their local chapters, they've been able to create a charter on medicines assessment and reimbursement, which is a really, really important advocacy tool when it comes to actually looking at equity of access for innovation, but also basic care as well. They've been part of a national strategy for patient registries in Ireland, again, ensuring the patient's voice and the patient's evidence is fed into patients' registries. So qualitative evidence, not just quantitative evidence, the quality of life dimension of living with a disease, not only the clinical aspects, which is really critical as well. And they've recently launched something called the Citizens Jury, 
the last one was focusing on patient data and looking at citizens' attitudes towards responsible sharing of patient data and thinking about some of the privacy, security, ownership, stewardship issues that come to mind when we talk about patient data, the value of patient data in the context of research, but also in the context of wise decision making in healthcare systems as well. So I'll talk a little bit about the methodology around the citizens jury in a moment, but I think this was a really exciting exercise to explore. And they're also part of the Irish eHealth Committee looking at digital transformation, again, injecting that very important patient, citizens and local perspective as we move into the digitalization of health and making sure that that human factor is very much at the fore. So looking at citizens juries as a methodology, this was first developed by the Jefferson Center in the US. And essentially, citizens' juries are a way of engaging citizens on a given topic. In Ireland, the health topic was, of course, responsible health data sharing, but it could be on other topics of interest to citizens. It might be around education, it might be around public transport, it might be around social policy, but definitely it is workable in a health environment. Typically, around 12 to 24 participants sit together over at least two days, so it's quite an intense and thorough process. And participants are selected according to criteria linked to demographics and diversity to get a wide perspective. They meet together in the form of a jury and independent neutral experts or witnesses address the topic at hand. So they give a very clear overview of a specific topic from different perspectives, but independent and neutral, so that the jury can build up a picture of what they feel should be the right way forward. And then the jury together, the 12 to 24 people sit together and come up with what's described as a consensus verdict, which is actually uh, presented in the form of a report. And what is important here is that policymakers and decision makers have already made a commitment to really listen to the outcome of the citizens jury and ensure that the content of that report informs the discussions around the policymaking area that they're looking at. In the case of Ireland, of course, it was looking at policies, national policies around responsible health data sharing. So you can see how the citizens jury process can actually help to inform and guide policymakers and really genuinely and authentically reflect the views of patients and citizens on any given topic. So it's quite an exciting and an interesting methodology to explore also potentially in a Bulgarian context. Jumping to the European level, there have been numerous examples over the years of patient involvement in EU health policy. A lot of exchange of expertise, of know-how, of leapfrogging. So that means looking at what's happening in one country and seeing how it could be applied in another country without going through all of the pain of getting there. So-called soft policy, so not hard, legislation but but soft policy that helps to move forward on different topics at european level we see examples of where the european patients forum and other patient organizations have really had a big voice in discussing policies around patient safety quality of care digital health patient empowerment patient access a lot of other topics and the discussions at European level, at least from EPF's perspective, have been very much fed by the national perspective and what is happening in reality on the ground in different countries, including Bulgaria. But then at the end of the day, when a policy has been agreed, when there is, for example, a white paper on quality of care, 
or a resolution on digital health, it's really important that, that is taken back into the countries and implemented. And the patient organisations have a really important role in making sure that that implementation works in their favour and affects positively the lives of patients. Another more concrete legislative example is the Pharmacovigilance Directive. Back in the day, we're going back almost 10 years ago now, and the European Patients Forum worked very closely with the European Parliament to introduce a specific article on direct patient reporting of adverse events. And this was really, really important from a, a patient empower, empowerment perspective. The way this, this was achieved in the European Parliament was through close collaboration with the community pharmacists who wanted the same thing. And this is interesting because it demonstrates the value of working in collaboration with other stakeholders around the table to really achieve your goals. This is one example, but there are many, many other examples, the cross-border healthcare directive, the clinical trials regulation, the legislation around health technology assessment, et cetera. So again, this full circle approach is, is really key. And in the work that you're doing in Bulgaria, it's very, very important to keep an eye on what's happening on the European agenda. So to close now, just to share with you a few learnings from my side that I've acquired with some pain over the years um, in terms of, of how to advocate effectively, how to actually generate change to support patients and citizens in their communities in terms of health and health outcomes and the things that really matter to them responding specifically to, to their needs and their goals. This is what we're all about. And that is, is really critical to have at the back of your mind when you're driving forward policy change and campaign work. The importance of solidarity, community identity, avoiding competition between different patient organizations or disease ranking. My disease is more important than your disease because that gives a perfect opportunity for policymakers just to say, oh, they can't agree. We'll divide and rule them and we won't make any progress on the topic at hand. So nobody wins. The importance of clarity of purpose, really understanding what it is you want, to think strategically about how to get there and plan, plan, plan. This takes time, effort, resources, patience, but it's really, really important to ensure success when it comes to advocacy and campaign lobbying. Making sure that the advocacy work that is undertaken has an evidence base. You're not just putting up your hand and saying, hey, we'd love to have this or we'd love to have that. We'd love to have change here or there. It must be much more organized and structured than that. And there needs to be real evidence on why the change that you're proposing will make a difference, is feasible, is workable, but will actually have a positive impact on patients and citizens when it comes to health at the end of the day. Using the policy hooks that are relevant in your context, be that local, regional or national. At European level, when we were working a lot on access over the years, we used the sustainable development goals, specifically goal three on health, that had a, a target on universal health coverage for all. And this policy drive at global level was really important and we use that as a backdrop for all of the work we did at European level on striving towards universal health coverage across the European Union. Because at the end of the day it's all about patients or it should be all about patients. Patients are in the centre. Patient organisations are increasingly recognised as a nat natural convener, bringing together different stakeholders who don't always agree with each other to come to solution oriented discussions to really negotiate healthy compromises and patient organizations if they're well organized and well structured are in an ideal position to be able to do that and I've seen that happen with NPO in Bulgaria over the years. And my final point is 
advocacy campaign work is really, really important, but it's so key that whatever comes out of those efforts, a piece of legislation, a policy, a directive, whatever, is implemented properly. Because if it's not implemented properly, then we've all wasted our time. So once the advocacy and campaign work is done, there needs to be a proper mechanism to enable patient organisations to really monitor how that policy is put into practice in concrete terms and an opportunity for patient organisations to dialogue with policymakers and decision makers to say, hey, this is going really well. It's great. We're really pleased with the collaboration. Or actually, I'm sorry, but this was a commitment, you were supposed to deliver this by X date, and this hasn't happened. Can we come together again? What are your plans to rectify that? That is also part of the patient organization's role, and it's also part of active citizenship. So with that, I'd like to close now. I am very much looking forward to working with you all on this really important and exciting project. And thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you once again.